You're listening to NIL Now, a podcast dedicated to the name, image, and likeness of today's college and high school athletes. So we're going to explore the crazy and wildly interesting world of name, image, and likeness. NIL Now, covering the latest sports business headlines and keeping you informed on the nation's top performers. This is NIL Now, where the stars of tomorrow are getting noticed today. It's the Wild Wild West, but we're wrangling it in. Presented by Headline Studio. And read it. Here are your hosts, Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. Hello there, my friends. Hope all is well, and welcome back to another episode of NIL Now, a production of Headline Studio and Reddit. We are out wherever you listen to your podcast, so be sure to subscribe. Later on, we're going to speak to Robert Boland, a Seton Hall University professor and a sports law expert. So, some great questions, great conversation coming around for that. So, stick around and then. Uh, Of course, we'll talk to Bob back in our second segment. But first and foremost, we've got a couple of cool headlines to get to today with my buddy, Kevin Jones. Kevin, how you doing, my friend? I'm good, especially since you're calling me Kevin today. I know. It's always interchangeable. I mean, it's just hard. It's just hard to know (laughs) what I'm feeling on any given day. So, you know, but today it's Kevin. NIL Headlines. So, Kevin. All right, so this is a cool story, and I think something we've kind of unpacked a little bit uh, just coming out of March Madness, talking about the just magnification of women's sports, especially surrounding March Madness. You look at the ratings, the TV ratings, and how things just amped up quite a bit from years past uh, with women's hoops, which I think is awesome. But I think a lot of that you can point to, as we talked about before, is NIL and the opportunity to capitalize on that brand awareness uh, on all platforms. And... I certainly think that really shined brightly uh, when you talk about someone like Angel Reese, um, who has made the decision not to turn pro. Now, part of that is, let's just go ahead and put full disclosure out there, she's not technically uh, able to turn pro at this point to declare for the draft. She has to either have graduated college or turned 22 years old. So that is not an option. But in an interview with her, basically talking about her status, that NIL has really changed the landscape for people like her, and uh, namely her and then Iowa's Caitlin Clark, both whom will return to school to play in college again next year. And really, NIL has given them an opportunity to be able to make a significant income and really capitalize on their name, image, likeness now and really build their brand before they even get to the top as a pro. You know, Kevin, I'm just kind of curious because I think that this is going to be a big part of the decision-making. And I think we talked about it earlier on the podcast, some of the earlier episodes, how this might change athletes' way of thinking when they decide to go to the next level. If staying behind, staying another year could benefit them. Do you think that this is something we're going to see more and more of as time goes on? Oh, absolutely. I think that you know, making it to the, the next level, WNBA, whether even if you think about the NBA, uh, NFL, you know, make it to professional sports. Uh, part of it is for that accomplishment to play as a pro, but uh, I think a even larger part, the financials that you get from being able to do that. I think that we'll see a lot more women for sure, um, especially with the with the pay gap to their counterparts. That they'll they'll stay in college longer to to make that money that it can that it can make off of the name, image, and likeness. Now, obviously, we know it's not all about money, but it's a huge part of it um, at at a certain time, at a certain point in time when you're you know, getting to the age of, of 22 and beyond, it's like, okay, I need to start thinking about what the future is going to be from a financial standpoint. And if you can stay in college and play for national championships and compete at a high level and still, and you know, make money off your personal brand, then why not? I, I, I would do it all day. Yeah. And it sounds like uh, that's exactly the sentiments Angel Reese is expressing in this clip here, talking about college versus the professional level. For I'm not in, in a rush to even I'm make that transition. Right I yeah. am. I'm in really? no rush to go to the league. No, because the money you can the make, money I'm making is right. more than some of the people that are in the league that might be top players. And Kevin, you know, I'd like to to mention here first and foremost, get this number. This this is crazy to me. So since the national championship win for Reese, her NIL valuation, according to On Three, has increased by one hundred and twenty four percent. Up to eight hundred and seventy six thousand dollars. Like what? It's crazy. I think the last time we talked, it was like six hundred and sixty nine thousand or something like that. 
And now that number is up two hundred thousand dollars. That's which is huge and good for her. You know, I think she's also taking a moment um, to use her platform to discuss some things that you know we all know what's going on, what what's been talked about with the taunting and you know the competitive nature of women in sports and people you know having double standards and stuff like that. So I think that that's also part of her brand right now, where people have been talking about her all year, all the things she's been doing. So she's been able to kind of be an advocate, be and speak speak up for herself and a lot of other other young women athletes. So I think that it's that's part of why you know her brand is going up. People want to support you know people who agree with what she's talking about. Also agrees with that type of competition in the game um, is raising her brand, and I'm pretty sure you know. Uh, a lot of the other women's uh, numbers are rising as well. Yeah, no doubt. And it, it, of course, uh, want to give credit to I, uh, the podcast that she first spoke about this on. I am athlete uh, with Brandon Marshall and Ashley Nicole Moss, uh, just kind of bringing light to that. And kind of the last thing I'll say before we wrap up this headline is, you know, I'm kind of interested in seeing as this this continues. Um, you know, one thing just sort of being around the Alabama football program a lot. And, you know, Nick Saban talks about when it's time for a player to make a decision if they're going to go pro or if they're going to stick around. You know, he obviously has been in the game a long time, has been on both sides of it from a, a you know, a college standpoint, professional level, determining sort of what that draft stock looks like. And is it in the best interest for the athlete to stay another year, develop, raise their stock and potentially their overall income status? Because we all know that's part of it. Or is it best to go ahead and, you know, cash that paycheck and, and move on? So I'd be curious to know as we're learning the landscape of this and how coaches are learning about it and how they are going to add this other layer, this other wrinkle into that determination of saying, okay, does it make more sense? So I'd be curious to know what's happening behind closed doors, you know, especially with b- big programs like Nick Saban and Alabama you know, when he sits these players down, how much of that conversation is now happening as it pertains to NIL and how much information is Nick Saban being able to generate from those potential opportunities? Because, you know, I don't think it's all out there plain as day. I don't think there's necessarily a metric for it, but I think that there has to be some sort of uh, formula to be able to plug in a potential NIL valuation to be able to uh, make that determination as to whether it's best to stick around or go to the next level. And and I think in this case, especially for female sports, because we know that that opportunity to go pro and of course with the numbers and the different formulas for, you know, compensation and everything might look a little different. And it's the same on the men's side too, depending on when you go in the draft or when you are picked up and, and there's a lot of different variables. So interesting conversation. And I certainly think it'll be interesting to see kind of how, Things uh, transpire there. So with that being said, Kevin, we're going to highlight the one and only Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. (sighs) (sighs) (laughs) We got to bring it on home, y'all, because y'all know. We need the Rutgers sound effects. (laughs) The Knights. You know, I'm ching, 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 ching. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and talk about your alma mater. Are you raw, raw? Yes, got to give a little love and shout out to my Rutgers Scarlet Knights. Woo woo! Uh, I'll get my DJ horn out. Wah wah! I see you smiling over there, Kevin. <laughs> DJ Sizzla <laughs> is here, here to stay. Okay. Dude, we gotta, we gotta fix your horn. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was like a rusty old bike horn. That <laughs> <laughs> oh, was pretty bad. Okay. Without further ado, five Rutgers athletes sign an NIL deal with the nonprofit organization Eco Athletes and will participate in a campaign focused on climate change activism. And I think this is pretty cool because this is not something I've really seen any partnerships, any headlines kind of in this space. Uh, some of the, the athletes to name, uh, gymnast Caitlin Bertola, Know the name well, obviously, former gymnast. What's up? Caitlin, holla, high five from over here in Alabama. Um, track athlete Alex Carlson, lacrosse player Kelsey Klein, and swimmers Haley Ohl and Natalie Schick all signed the deal organized by the Rutgers Focus Collective called Knights of the Raritan. So uh, the athletes will take part in a campaign through social media posts and appearances around campus. And I think it's pretty cool because uh, Eco Athletes has signed over 113 athletes to help promote this mission including professionals as well as uh, there in the college ranks. So you've got, you know, MLB players, NFL, NHL, and WNBA. So I think it's a pretty cool initiative. 
and something, um, you know, I'm on board with. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely a, a cool initiative to see athletes, you know, student athletes being in, at the universities and being a part of an initiative like this, using their name, image, and likeness and leveraging that for a worthy cause. But then also like doing it alongside of like professional athletes as well to kind of get that exposure to doing it at Rutgers, but you, the campaigns and things that they're doing um, to to highlight this, they're using pro athletes too. So it's kind of a cool thing to be exposed to like, you know, what their lifestyles might be, you know, if they're doing a commercial or something like that, that, that gives, you know, those, those conversations can happen. So, you know, climate change is something that's at the forefront of, uh, I think a lot of people's minds and they don't really know how to get involved with it or how to make a difference. And I think that this is doing that. So, yeah. And, and it, it, it seems as though after seeing some of the comments from these particular athletes, that this is something they align with and have a passion for. So I think it's a win-win for everybody. All right. Last Headline before we get to Bobak, our good friend there. NIL Summit announces its finalists for this year's award. And so we've had some past winners on our show, including Raekwon Smith of Norfolk State, the king of NIL, two time NIL male athlete of the year, Chase Griffin, uh, that was UCLA's quarterback. And then this year, former guest Jack Betts and Amherst Football is a finalist for the Hustle Award, nominated alongside LSU's Angel Reese, which is cool. And uh, Raekwon Smith actually won that award last year with the Hustle Award because we've seen his numbers just continue to grow as he just dominates in the NIL space. So, uh, yeah, congrats to them for those nominations and finalists. Raekwon. Uh, it's always good to see his name pop up. He was a good interview. Learned a lot from him and Chase. I mean, all, all of these folks we learned a lot from, but they, they really stuck out. But you know what's cool this year is uh, they're presenting a high school player of the year. Um, they also have a category for best individual campaign, some of which we've talked about uh, this show. Um, some of the 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 categories is you know in companies is Cheez Its Hotel, which was very I'm the cheesy. cheesiest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the Popeyes meme kid, we which is him. funny. Everybody loved that. We want to get him on the show. Yeah, for sure. That that would be that would be good. <laughs> and then we got to have like him in that picture next to him the whole time. Pringles March Madness, which we didn't really understand why we didn't couldn't purchase the Pringles, but yeah. it was still a it cool made, concept. Well, it made me crave some Pringles, I'll tell you that. <laughs> then you have the Serious Bean Company with Jason Bean, um, Shinesty Tommy Brown, and then the SOS Heating and Cooling, Decodis Crawford. I was about to say, you gotta give you gotta give his name some love. Decodis. <laughs> Decodis Crawford. Yeah. That's a cool name. I love it. Hey, awesome. you know one one name we fought we we didn't really uh we didn't say we didn't say Bayou Barbie. That's a cool name uh, for Angel Reese too. Oh yeah, that is. I like that the Bayou Barbie. She's definitely uh, wearing that title well. I think she uh, embraces embraces it and obviously has a lot of fun with it. So yeah, it's 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 definitely cool to see all the names that are on that list, and um, I love that they're doing that. I think it just continues to highlight the the world of NIL and gives them an opportunity to 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 win something outside of just their athletic space. So. Kudos to them. And without further ado, we're going to bring on our good friend, Bob Ag. NIL Now with Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. If you want to learn more about name, image, and likeness, you need to go to The Source. The NIL Now podcast from Headline Studio and Reddit highlights the, the biggest, biggest storyline. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be a part of these young men and women's future to you know, further their careers. You should be able to leave college with something. Subscribe to NIL Now on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Yo, Bobak, what's up? Hi, Lauren. It's great to hear from you. How is everyone doing today? It is a wonderful day here in lovely Minnesota where we lay our scene. Is it sunny and warm? It is sunny. It is like 70-something. What? People don't know what to do with themselves. The buildings haven't been shifted from heating in a lot of these larger buildings, so it is just abysmally hot because it, it's just <laughs> – these buildings all suddenly get really warm because, you know, they got to switch the master air conditioning on. Um, they usually don't do that until May, so it's just one of those days. Officially spring. Yep. Still snow on the ground, though. <laughs> it's still snow on the ground. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's tons of it. They gotta melt all this stuff. It's gonna be. It's gonna probably be June before it all melts. I would guess. Wow, but. that's that's wild and crazy. Well, speaking of spring, looking forward to some spring football this weekend. 
the Hokies are having their spring football game, so I get to go hang out with KJ, and I'm pumped about it. Whoop, whoop, holla, holla. Yes, sir. Let's talk some NIL legal terminology because our legal expert, Bobak, is always good at this. So Oklahoma's sweeping NIL bill is one step closer to becoming a law. So what this means, legal experts say the bill provides cover for OU, OSU, and Tulsa from being punished for any NIL-related violations, including any committed by collectives. So without further ado, Bob, I just jump in on this thing and tell us what this thing is all about and how this could really shape and change things for the NIL space, especially there in the state of Oklahoma. Yeah, absolutely. This is a continuation of what we've been seeing in the last oh, year or so, where states who initially passed more restrictive NIL laws that, you know, because I think that was perhaps the initial public reaction to NIL legislation that was, of course, first pushed forth by California was, oh, we don't want this to go out of control. It's going to ruin the sport, blah, 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 blah. And then so these initial rounds of rules that were passed by states were quite strict. And as we've seen, other states, you know, like Alabama, like Florida, have started to loosen up those laws. And now it is Oklahoma's turn to do so. Now, the state of Oklahoma has had some fun with it. Obviously, the the three FBS programs are, you know, the University of Oklahoma Sooners, Oklahoma State, and Tulsa. It's one of those wonderful kind of bipartisan topics to get people talking about college sports. I think it passed like 84 to 5, something like that. And one of those things they included in the bill it was that the NCAA couldn't really enforce its laws or its rules, I should say, laws is a bit of a strong word, its rules within the state of Oklahoma. Whether that works or not, who knows? No one's ever really challenged a law like that. It seems to be sort of just throwing it out there. And state legislators have been known throughout the land to pass laws that may not pass muster in a challenge because, hey, you know what? It's like the uh, minor leagues for the uh, Congress. You know? <laughs> It's, it's a bunch of folks who kind of aren't necessarily the sharpest legislatures in the bunch. So this could work or it could not. We just don't know. And, and maybe that's exactly what we'll see as it moves forward. Certainly, we're going to see more of this, especially as a blue blood like in Oklahoma in particular wants to stay competitive with its rival Texas or all of those new SEC friends it's going to be having um, as it joins that conference. But certainly, we're going to see that in, in states with significant I think athletic programs, not just football, basketball, too, and, and all the other sports. But the, the, the revenue sports where all this big money is happening, we're going to see a lot of this kind of um, step back. Now, the other big question, and, and it certainly is mentioned anytime it comes up, will we see federal legislation on this? That would make things easier to some extent because then everyone would be playing by the same rules. They're going to see a race to the bottom otherwise, and I think we're starting to see that. The idea of like Oklahoma suddenly saying, like, well, the NCAA can't even enforce its rules in our state. Suddenly it seems like other you know big recruiters, other big universities, you can imagine um, if it could in any way – harm the benefit of Nick Saban's ability to recruit, it's going to come up in the Alabama legislature. So, you know, we're going to see this kind of of bouncing backwards and forwards until it, we might see an attempt by Congress to legislate it. Now, whether they have the ability to do so, who knows? For some folks, that would be the ideal because then you put everyone on the same playing field. But what that playing field would be and whether it would be more restrictive than some of the states, that would create a potential for conflict. You know, it's wild to see, like, for them to make that rule because I feel like if it if it, if it all goes through and it all changes in that way, and the NCAA might not be be able to do anything about it unless you know, like they say, unless they get the feds involved. I don't know. I feel like every other state would would follow suit with that because this is um it's kind of a game changer if it happens, and it will allow you know the athletic departments and things like that to you know kind of bring it in house, you know, kind of get their you know, their grips around it. Very interesting. I will say, meanwhile, on RCFB, they've been commenting about what's been going on here. I got to say, one of my favorite comments came from the Oklahoma State fans, because a lot of them kind of putting it best. It's like, oh, man, uh, this is uh, G. Stilly, one of the uh, Oklahoma State fans. Obviously, it's still a lot of reference. Gosh, if T. Boone, and, and that's a reference to their billionaire, their late billionaire um, benefactor, T. Boone Pickens. If he were still around, we'd be giving out acres of land to recruits. And to an extent, you know, Brett Exkin is like, you know, five-star QBs will get their own oil well. Although, bird lawyer person, the Texas fan, I think put it best, each parcel of land should be a loot box. If you don't fully know which ones have valuable mineral rights, 
but the tantalizing possibility makes it even more attractive to the 18 year old brain. And if we're being honest, the 30 year old brain as well. So I think a lot of fans are having fun <laughs> with what could happen is uh, with, with a lot of this opportunity. Some fans are actually wondering if Pelsa should even really be mentioned uh, in all of this, considering the, the sheer amount of money that's thrown around in Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. All right, Bob, back. all great stuff there. So now let's get out of the legal pool for a moment and head on over to the pedestal that everyone talks about that they're putting this 18, well, he just turned 19-year-old quarterback uh, that has showed up to Penn State, and his name is Drew Allar. Pretty fresh-faced kid, 6'5". He weighs 242 pounds. He uh, enrolled early in January, and basically the – Expectations are very high for this young young lad. And I must admit, as I've been scrolling and perusing the uh, Redditor's comments, there's quite a f- few, let's just say, funny ones to go around on this one. So I want to get your take on sort of how this whole situation is being handled, uh, you know, just kind of with his agency, uh, with the branding, um, the expectations, and it's worth noting, too, that uh, Josh Allen and he do share an agent over at CAA. So um, this is a different world we live in. And so I just want you to kind of break this one on down for us so we can uh, better understand what is going on in the world of Penn State football and this uh, young budding quarterback that everyone is raving about. Yeah, he's been a real point of excitement for a lot of the Penn State fans. I remember – when he early enrolled um, in January 2022, uh, a lot of folks, because they put him behind Sean Clifford on the QB list, so there's a lot of great expectations for this young man at Penn State. So we heard a lot about that last fall coming from that fan base. So now this is his chance to shine. He's going to go out there and likely be the starter. Of course, it is a competition. But what makes this story about him so fascinating is, as you said, he not only does he share – um, the same agent as uh, Buffalo QB Josh Allen. He shares the same agency as his head coach, James Franklin. And it's kind of fascinating too because it's CAA. CAA, um, for those who aren't familiar with Creative Artists Agency, is one of the mega agencies originally just for like Hollywood, like all the major movie stars and directors and all of that stuff. Like they're not an agency you ask to represent you. They ask, they tell you, we'll represent you. And so they were able to poach some of those legendary agents like Jimmy Sexton, who, of course, got Franklin that massive uh, contract. And so the agent for Drew and for Josh uh, is, is uh, I believe his last name is Curtis. He's part of that team, and he's one of, like, the disciples within there. I know he's a, a young, budding star. He was, a, you know, one of the, the NFL's 30 under 30 and then 40 under 40 once he passed 30. So he's one of these these rising agents, and it's kind of fascinating just to think about all of that. I know someone on Reddit even joked, like, "Does is there an agency discount because they, uh, his head coach and him both use CAA? That, that dynamic and whether or not that creates a benefit for the players, especially those young men who are going to get you know, high-profile NIL, NIL contracts, because it's really fascinating. Like, he's now on his Twitter account. It says NIL and his social media, any NIL interest. Just forward it to, and it's a wonderful email address. It's like his agent's name dot nil at caa. So he's got a, a system set up there to to get him. I mean, he's going to write a children's book too. That was, by the way, I don't know if anyone saw that in the article. Like one of his nil deals is he's agreed to write a children's. Oh, I love book. that. Yeah, and I, that. I just hope it's fantastic. I hope it's like the next where the wild things are, where his quarterback career, <laughs> whatever it ends up, like he's actually then he's going to like hopefully live to be a wise old man in his 80s. And people are going to be kids are just going to want his autograph because he wrote the children's book because people will continue <laughs> to remember the children's book long after anybody's a QB. That is very true. And I love that point. I think the children's book thing is awesome. I'd love to know, I guess, sort of the premise behind it. But yes, that is a book that I will say that has come back to me. And especially as we uh, look forward to welcoming baby, baby Willard uh, into the world in June. uh, One of the books that I definitely have on my list to make sure is on the bookshelf so that we can uh, read it to the young lad when, uh, when he's born. So, you know, maybe this will be another one on the bookshelf. You never know. Yeah. To me, this whole agent world and college sports um, is interesting. It's an interesting topic mainly because, you know, the type of contact that they're allowed to have now with college players with the player just saying my agent now it just it's, it every time I still have a knee jerk reaction like wait what did you say <laughs> you know so it's just that that part to me is like 
first of all, obviously he's going to be, you know, all everything on the field, but the whole my agent part while still being a college athlete and talking about my coach, I have the same agent as my coach. And then also uh, Josh, that one, I'm still trying to wrap my head around. So it's like the norm now. Every time I talk to a kid, when I hear him say that, I'm like, wait, what? What are you, my you're what? <laughs> my agent. My agent. Yeah, exactly. Now, they're not even, because, you know, they're not even saying NIL agent. They're just saying my agent, you know? So I just think it's a little weird. I don't know, Kevin. When did, how old were you when you got your first agent? When I was going to the NFL. <laughs> so what? So uh, how old were you 21? at the time? 21? 22? Yeah, 21, I think. I guess basically we're speeding up that process, you know, 18 going on 19 year old now having an agent, <laughs> yeah. but you know, I mean, it is, uh, it's definitely different to me. It's not even about age. It's just, I mean, it is about age. That's one part of it. But then the other part yeah. of it is like, I'm a college athlete talking about an NFL agent. <laughs> it's just funny because I mean, if you think about it in the grand scheme of things out in the world, I mean, a lot of these young influencers are getting agents now at an early age. You know, you got models and actors. They all have agents, whether they're two years old or 10 years old or whatever else. It's just it is weird. Like you said, being in this landscape, talking about athletics and sports and college, um, you know, athletics in, in general. And then people saying, let me defer to my agent on this one. <laughs> it is kind of fascinating, too, when you see. They're taking a bet on some of these young men because, you know, their their careers could not pan, could possibly not pan out. But it's funny to see someone of the caliber of some of these agents stepping in and representing some of these young men. Like, again, he's not started yet for Penn State. Uh, you know, he's he's hasn't yet to really prove himself on the field and maybe he will pan out. But it reminds me of sometimes, you know, you'll you'll meet some of the folks who are early agents or, or you know, young agents or young people in um, in various things where they sort of taking a risk on some of the lesser known players and hoping that they get that second contract, you know, they get that, 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 that big, huge contract in the end. And then they get those big fees because it's, it's sort of funny to watch. I wonder for how long we'll see some of these really top agents representing some of these early college players who have yet to really demonstrate their ability in, uh, in, in play over a season or two. So I'm really curious to see how long that lasts. Cause if it doesn't pan out, an uh, agent might say, like, I can't believe I just spent all this time nurturing this particular player. Because even Drew, he's like, you know, I talk to my agent maybe once, you know, once a week. We just talk about life if it isn't about NIL things. And that's a normal thing. That's what you'd want an agent to do. You'd want it to be interest and show an interest in you. But if it doesn't pan out, I mean, at what point are these guys going to be like, I could be getting a lot more money representing somebody who will get a contract? Yeah, the wilder side to that is they're going to matriculate down to high school, too. It's like once these laws get uh, loosened up. Well, and we know CAA is a massive agency. And, you know, I would be curious to know sort of what the ratios are, especially in this world, let's just say from the athlete standpoint. Obviously, it's the same agent that represents, uh, you know, Josh Allen that's at the higher level. I'd be curious, though, to know just in general how many guys one agent per se is taking on at a given time and how much of that is, like you said, the guarantee in Josh Allen and uh, essentially the gamble that you're taking with Drew in this in this instance. Yes, that's why Jimmy Sexton is is more on James Franklin and Nick Saban and people like that, you know. Um, I can't remember if he represents uh, Saban, but I know Saban joined CAA last year or two years ago as well. So uh, the people who might be representing those kind of guaranteed cash cows might be the more senior folks and then the younger people like this agent might be the one that, that are willing to take the risk. You're listening to NIL Now. All righty, folks. Now it is time for our third and final segment of the show. And this one I'm looking forward to because today we're going to inherit a wealth of knowledge from Robert Boland, but I'm told to call him Bob. So, Bob Boland, a lawyer, professor at Seton Hall University, and a sports law expert. He previously served as Penn State's athletic integrity officer and taught at Ohio University as well as NYU. He has negotiated over 100 player and endorsement contracts and writes for lead1a.com about sports law topics, amongst many other things, Bob. Uh, welcome to the show. And why don't you just go ahead and dive into all the 
impressive irons in the fire that you have that I did not yet get to. Lauren, I think you did a pretty terrific job getting all of them. Other, other than we, we, we didn't add that or you sort of obliquely touched on the fact that I was a player agent representing NFL players and some women athletes for about 10 years um, prior to that while I was teaching at NYU and that I'm also affiliated with the law firm of Shoemaker, Kendrick & Loop. I'll give them the little the little shameless plug. Shoemaker, Kendrick & Loop was named one of the top 100 sports law practices in the country, and I'm part of their sports law group. But they're the best not because I work there. I work there because they're the best. <laughs> nice. I love nice. that, Bob. The biggest reason I wanted to make sure we got that on the table is you got some street cred, my friend. So let's <laughs> let that street cred shine bright because we had a conversation at the top of the show that I thought was interesting. Um, just talking about women's athletics, specifically basketball, the NCAA tournament, obviously, uh, for women's basketball was very well uh, highlighted this year. The ratings spoke for itself. And then, of course, you, you hear about um, these women that are inking these amazing NIL deals, and namely, as we talked about, LSU's Angel Reese at the top of the show. Now, she's not eligible to go to the WNBA just yet, but after a conversation, you know, it's, it, it's quite apparent that this was a decision she was going to make. And I think I'm curious to know from your standpoint as an agent, someone that's got their hands in this, we're going to start seeing more and more athletes potentially stay because of NIL, but there's some nuances in there that have to be considered when you do kind of weigh out whether the money is better and the opportunity is better to stay or to declare for uh, professional residency, if you will. Yeah, that's a terrific question. And in fact, one of the greatest things about NIL is it will allow athletes to make good decisions about turning professional. They won't have to be riskily timed. They won't have to come at the expense of of, of their, their staying in school and earning their degree, you can actually choose that in some cases because of NIL and, and, and the ability to support your family in many cases as well because athletes are, are carrying more on their shoulders than ever before. So a lot of what NIL is really, really does have positive outcomes uh, attached to it around that. I, I represented women's basketball players back at the beginning of this century, so a long, long time ago now. Uh, the first couple of years of the WNBA, and I had worked at Tennessee in the in the women's athletic department, so I was around high quality women's basketball during that period of time. The conundrum has always been the same: I can make several hundred thousand dollars a year, or a hundred plus, playing abroad, as we've seen now. Even even though that comes with a lot of pitfalls, like Brittany Griner's imprisonment uh, in Russia, where she was going to earn money to to keep her family. Uh, Fed during the course of the year, or I can play for small money in the U.S. in the WNBA, usually around thirty or forty thousand dollars, and then try to build my life around that with endorsements or with coaching. So it's kind of like if you're going to be a women's athlete, a women's professional basketball player, you're probably going to go abroad. Now, with the exposure the tournament's gotten and some of the star power, staying in college and, and playing for NIL is a really good choice, and it also has this other benefit: it can set you up toward your future whether that future is in coaching, whether that future is in endorsement, whether that future is in a, in a different career, but based on your education, I think that has really good value to it. So we're seeing it for the right reasons in, in the women's side. In fact, just in some conversation with Tom McMillan at Lead One, who I think is a, a guru of a lot of this and obviously represents the athletic directors in this, most of the women out there are doing what we would call real NIL. They're actually they're actually signing deals with people who will use their their name, image, and likeness in sponsorship, and they're actually actively earning that. We're seeing a little less of that on the men's side, percentage wise, and I'm even hearing of this horrible abuse that that men's basketball players are in some cases being persuaded by agents to transfer schools, have the agent take twenty percent on the endorsement NIL money that they have coming in or is promised coming in from the new collective. And rather than taking 3% of an NBA contract, which would be much more for the player, and probably at the end of the day, much better for the player in the long run. The idea of playing professionally and having a pro career and getting off your rookie contract because all the rookies are squeezed, much better, much better solution. And I would say to you for male athletes, and there are there are some certainly some differences, but almost no male athlete is in a, in a, in a revenue sport is making as much on NIL as he, as he could be making in the pros. That's not true of women. Yeah, that's the facts that we got to kind of remember here. So for the women, it's a little bit different in their situation. They have a, it's actually an easier, I would say, an easier choice to stay in school, continue playing at a high level, and collect on their name, image, and likeness. 
One other thing I wanted to shift gears a little bit and ask you, what, what's your thoughts on uh, on the new guy, Charlie Baker, with the NCAA, his first days in office? Where is he going with, with everything? What do you think about all that? As somebody who's done nothing but look at it, almost NIL exclusively for a year, which is sort of maybe not entirely true, but a very true that NIL has been a big focus of what we've looked at. I think Baker is trying to make what I think is a bit of a narrow squeeze play. The NCAA really can't regulate a whole lot because of their antitrust exposure. We learned that in Alston. We learned that in O'Bannon. We know that they don't have a lot of ability to be to be a rule maker anymore. And they can get out of the rulemaking business and stick to championships and avoid some of the antitrust liability that they have, or they can look to use NIL, and I, and I think they're using looking to use NIL as a little bit of a hook to get some antitrust immunity back. And I could see, I'm not 100% sure of this because I can't bet this Congress will do anything, but I think this Congress may, may look to a bipartisan solution to allow the NCAA kind of some oversight of NIL across the board. I don't think that's mandated or needed, uh, but I certainly think Baker, kind of the consummate compromise-making politician, is moving for it, and I think he sees it as his hook to get back in. So if I were betting, that's where he's headed. He'd like to get himself some antitrust immunity and then kind of reposition his entire his entire membership a little bit. But he wants to use it around NIL because, as you know, KJ, in the work that you're doing, Lauren, in the work that you do, NIL still mystifies more people than it should. It is not that complicated, but it it is it is the thing that is blamed for everything. Man, trying to talk to donors and people who want to support, they st- it's still like like there's some veil over everyone's eyes, and it's it's not. It's 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 pretty simple. Um, but I think it's just another way. You know, it's just another thing. It's another ask that when um, you get donor fatigue and people want to. They're 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 like wait where, you want us to give in another way wait well how does this affect scholarship and all these different pieces that they want to talk about well and and so many people didn't want it right KJ it was it, right. it was the athletic directors who didn't particularly like it the coaches who were suddenly afraid that they were being out recruited in it or getting somebody was getting more so so many people didn't like it it came into it came into into being kind of as a as a bit of an afterthought. Mm. Hey, so let's talk about your favorite twins, the Cavender twins down in Miami. <laughs> so that, I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be unkind, and I don't mean to because I don't know them, and they're athletes, and I, I don't have any concern about about them earning what they're earning. I was yeah. sort of concerned that, that that Miami managed to get put on probation and have their, their, their coach, you know, have a career threatened over recruiting two players who average a total of 15 points a game. Uh, they aren't transformational players. They may be transformational marketers, but they're not trans- – one's a pretty good player. The other's, the other's a reserve. And that was sort of something that said it to me is – and I sort of have a couple – I have a bunch of rules around NIL that I'm, I'm trying to develop into some version of you know stone tablets I'm going to walk down to uh, with, uh, with Easter <laughs> one day. But – <laughs> or, 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 or at least Mel Brooks and drop one along the way, like History of the World Part One. But I think one of them is why are we paying? Why are why are we paying for people who don't perform well for us? And why are we paying to have people transfer? You know that Miami had a pretty good season. I can't take that away from them. But I, you know, would you have been better off trying to offer a- April Reese a big endorsement deal, who's a stunning player, or or Caitlin? Clark, who's a stunning player, uh, you know, all time, all time greats when you think about it. And on the same token, I think that there's still more money, and, and, and this is in the long run of NIL, for athletes who choose to stay at one school because your relationship with it will and who you are will, will echo through time with that school rather than having some success in leaving. I think that 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 is really chasing the smallest of small money and professionalizing NIL more than it needs to be. Yeah, I agree and disagree with you. So like Angel and Caitlin, for sure. But like if you think about if they go from one big time university to another, like Angel is going to be known as, you know, someone in the history books at LSU, but she came from University of Maryland. Yep. So th- in that case where you transfer from one big program to another and you do better at the second program, they're going to remain, remember you forever as well. You, you got to do better, I, right? Though That's the hard yeah, thing. Yeah, you're right. In most cases, you're right. You're right. <laughs> but in this case, I would think that it's a little bit different. I, I, 
I think there are a lot of reasons to transfer. Transfer for a great graduate program. Transfer for, uh, for, <laughs> for to finish your degree faster. Transfer because you can play in a better program and have that opportunity. It'll make you a better pro potentially. No gripe about any of that. But I do have I do have the one where it's like just simply switch one school to the left when you kind of get there. Yeah, um, that's true. That's true. Because, I can see that because it, it it will it will eventually create that because not everybody gets to win that way. That's a unicorn. All right, Bob, answer this question for me. What are some of the issues handing down infractions in the situation of John Ruiz as the private businessman and consign those athletes to an NIL deal and claim that he's not tampering with recruitment? Like, what are your thoughts there? You know, that becomes a really interesting one, Lauren. Uh, the challenge for that is there are antitrust challenges if the NSA is restricting somebody from, from doing business privately with individuals where it's legal. It looks like the timing was the chief issue in this case, but I think really the better issue is how much how much control does a, does a school have over its athletes, and how much can it use meeting with donors and and prospective NIL participants as an inducement to switch schools? And I think that's going to be the place where that infraction comes down. But it's going to be very hard to police this. Um, I think the IRS will be the ultimate arbiter of of, of NIL rather than the NCAA. All right. As we wrap up, Bob, I did want to ask you your Twitter bio, doing a little investigative reporting here. It says you are working on an NIL book. So what what can you tell us about this book? You mentioned those tablets that you might be dropping along the way. Is that I, I'll have the, I'll have the 10 biggest myths and lies of NIL when I get to the book. The book is going slowly, but I have co-authors. It's supposed to be the first textbook for a college course in, in NIL. So it digs into amateurism, the history of it, why it why it survived so long in the college context when it when it went away in other places like the Olympics much quicker, and it, it will be a place where we'll, we'll all have we'll all help dispel some of the myths of NIL that that these thing that these things are just an excuse for now it's legal, which certainly some of this has been, but so much more of it has been a way of empowering athletes, giving them greater choice giving them greater agency over their career and their playtime. And I think on that level, it's a wonderful thing. So it, when the book eventually gets done and it languishes right now, because I'm teaching, I got a, I got my dream teaching job at Seton Hall Law out of the blue, and I've been working in the law firm pretty pretty busily setting up collectives. So this has been an interesting time because my work in NIL has kept my writing in NIL from being as fast as I'd like. But uh, we're going on it, and it'll be out probably by the fall, hopefully for classes. Love it. Such good insight and good sense of humor, Bob. We like good senses of humor around here. So we appreciate it. Uh, Really good stuff there. Anything else that's just weighing on you right this moment before we let you go? Anything that you just want to spit game on right now? I'll take I'll I'll take the the big spit on this one. And, and, And so much of the confusion around NIL has been created by famous coaches who didn't like to see their world change. Never mind, they never had a, a level playing field. They like their unlevel playing field. Uh, but I think it was, it, you know, we, we, we've messed up education on NIL, and, and it's because of all the people we need to educate. We need to educate coaches. We need to educate athletic directors. We need to educate students and their parents. And then, to some degree, the community around it, because I think everyone has had misunderstanding in this space, but probably none None worse than, than big time coaches who, who feel like it's either a great threat or a great opportunity and are and are leaning in or re- leaning away too hard in both directions. Mic drop. Yes, a mic drop indeed. Thank you, Robert, i.e. Bob, i.e. Professor Boland. <laughs> we appreciate you and uh, all that you have uh, enlightened us on today. Always good conversations here on the NIL Now podcast. And certainly you added a lot of great intel, sense of humor. Love it. We're going to be interested to hear more about this book. As I know it's a slow process, but most uh, most of those book processes are. So we'll be anxious to see that when that time comes. But to follow you, uh, we can follow you on Twitter, uh, Robert Bolin ESQ. And of course, you can follow us on our show, NIL Now, on Twitter, as well as Reddit on NIL uh, that front. So let us know what you think about the show. Find next week's podcast out wherever you listen to your podcast. And please subscribe. Thank you again to Bob Akhairi, the Reddit College football team. Also a big thank you to my co-host, KJ. I didn't give you the Kevin, okay? KJ. I'm Lauren Sisler. A big thanks to audio engineer Colin Schmeling, our associate producer, Dean Zolkowski, and our executive producers, Richard Diamond, Selena Roberts, and Scott Roeder. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. 
Thanks for listening to NIL Now, presented by Headline Studio and Reddit.